Okay, a lot of people ask me this. How does Phineas put on his shirt? Well, the answer to that is a very closely guarded secret. So closely guarded, in fact, that we have hidden the answer in a place we felt like no one would ever find it. In the opening number to the highest rated animated telecast ever on basic cable. Phineas and Ferb across the second dimension. Here it is. One more time slowly. But the real question you should be asking is how does Phineas get those orange stripes on his shirt? And that's a secret we have guarded even more closely. You'd have to watch for two more seconds. Okay, I've been getting one question a lot all of a sudden. I don't know why it's suddenly come up. Maybe everybody suddenly got to the same episode on Disney+. Plus. Your name is Ferb? Well, yes, it's short for... Oh, here it is. What is Ferb short for? So in the second to last episode, Act Your Age, where we go into the future and we find out that Ferb and Vanessa are dating, she calls him this. Hey, Ferbs, you ready? She calls him Ferbs. Ferb is short for Ferbs. What I didn't say was a lot shorter. It's 20% off. If that was a sale, you would buy it. Okay, can we just talk a little bit about these internet theories? Because I still get asked this all the time. And the answer is no. Candace does not have schizophrenia. She's not imagining what the boys are doing. That's just a super dark meme that somebody made up. But this one is even darker. Because in this version, Candace dies. Then, and I quote... After the funeral, Candace's mom read her diary and asked Walt Disney himself to create a program from it. What would that have been like? Mr. Disney, my daughter died tragically. Could you make a funny cartoon from the schizophrenic ramblings in her diary? Well, you are in luck, ma'am, because all of our living non-schizophrenic writers are completely out of ideas. And people still ask us on a regular basis if this is how it happened. And no, this is not how it happened. Swampy? Seriously, we promise. Plus, Doofenshmirtz is not Phineas's dad, and neither is Pinhead Pierre. Pinhead Pierre? Yeah, I found this online when I was looking for those memes. Wow. I know, right? Okay, a few days ago I made a video debunking some of the online theories about Phineas and Ferb, one of which I said, Doof is not Phineas's dad. And I got a lot of anger about this. I had people arguing with me as though I wouldn't know. The thing is, we made that impossible in the series. A lot of people point to this flashback from What Do It Do, where Doof and Linda go on a blind date. But at the end of that date, Doofenshmirtz says very clearly, and then I never saw her again. Now, Phineas and Ferb are stepbrothers, but Phineas and Candace are full brother and sister, and they're about five years apart. So it is technically impossible for the Doof to be Phineas's dad. The thing that I find funny is that no one ever asks, who's Ferb's mom? Hmm. I'm just kidding, it's not her. Dan, Dan, please, tell me who sings Evil Boys from Phineas and Ferb. Everywhere on the internet says it was Candace Flynn, but it's obviously not Ashley Tisdale, because her voice is much higher than that. Okay, it's sort of early in the morning for this, but... Those boys are always up to something. It's bringing me to tears. It's just before you get home. It always magically disappears. Those boys are evil. Before you get home, they somehow always clean up the mess. Those boys are evil. E-V-I-L-B-O-I-S. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so a lot of people have asked me to explain this joke. Where is Patty? What did you say? I was just asking where Patty is. Oh. What did you think I said? Uh, well, I thought you said... Uh, never mind, it was too weird. The thing is... A lot of the stuff that went into Phineas and Ferb was just stuff that amused me at the time. And it really amused me that we would never find out what Isabella thought he said. Um, but if you really want it, here it is. So we're in a brainstorming meeting pitching new ideas for Phineas and Ferb episodes. And somebody brings up the fact that nobody knows what a shoelace tip is called. And I said, well, I know. It's called an aglet. That's what we should have Phineas and Ferb do for an episode, is raise aglet awareness. And nobody could figure out how that would even be a story. They were like, really? And one renegade story team we had, John and Piero, stepped forward and they said, 
we'll do it. So after a week, they pitched me this story that it was like a Da Vinci Code conspiracy to keep the word aglet a secret. And I said, it's not that. It's just that it's a word that exists that nobody's ever used. They just need to raise awareness for it. And they were like, well, then it doesn't matter. And I was like, exactly. And that can be Candace's point of view. Wait a minute. It doesn't matter. And if we do it right, there'll be a whole generation that knows what an aglet is. I'll bet you you knew. So a lot of people ask me how the Phineas and Ferb Star Wars special happened. We were in a mix when that news broke and somebody saw it on their phone and said, oh my gosh, Disney just bought Lucasfilm for $44 billion. The very first thing I did, I had a pencil in my hand, I drew this picture. I texted it to the head of the studio with the caption, I smell crossover. And uh, later that week, he was in a meeting with Bob Iger. And at the end of the meeting, he just showed him that text on his phone. And Bob said, yeah, we got to get right on that. And for me, who was the first kid in line for the very first showing of Star Wars in Mobile, Alabama in 1977, that was like playing at a candy store. There's a couple other really funny stories about making that special. If you like this one, I'll make it a series. We were in the middle of breaking the story for the Star Wars Phineas and Ferb special. And somebody called me and said, hey, Eric, the head of the studio, wants you to come into this meeting so you can meet the executives from Lucasfilm. And I said, I am not ready to pitch this story yet. And they said, oh, no, he knows that the story's not ready. He just wants you to come down and have a meet and greet. And I said, well, okay. And I came down to the meeting. And then Eric just says, hey, can you pitch us the story? Okay, he didn't get the memo. I'll just... I just launched into it. The problem was we had a whole bunch of sections that didn't connect in any satisfying ways. But because I was telling the story out loud to these guys, I solved all these story holes as I was going and was able to connect everything beautifully. And at the end of it, they were like, oh, this is, this is really great. And I excused myself and I went out and I grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil as fast as I could so I could write down what I had said because they were solutions we had been looking for for like two weeks. So I guess necessity is the mother of invention. When did Phineas and Ferb's parents get together? We know that this Love Handle concert was really important to them and you can see they, ha they look super young and their style is different. Here, they both have their like older clothes on, they have like older style, that's when Ferb came into the family. Okay, I get asked this a lot, so I'm gonna try to clear it up. When Linda and Lawrence went on their first date to that Love Handle concert, they were both single parents. They both had kids at home with babysitters. Then six months later or so, when they decide to get married, they're not that much older, they just no longer dress like they're at a concert. I know the costuming is a little confusing because Love Handle sort of dresses like an 80s band. We just thought that was funny, but that concert takes place in like late 90s, early 2000s. The thing is, I know I'm going to have to post this video again in like six months because people will continue to ask me this. Just like, no, Candace is not crazy. No, the boys are not dead. No, Doof is not Phineas's dad. Those videos exist too. You can just go scroll through my page if you want. I guess my question is, are all moms simps for Dr. Doof and Schmertz? Well, yeah. Why does that surprise you? If they are, this is the very first I've heard of it. So someone asked me who's the most famous person I've worked with, and I'm not sure how to measure most famous, but I will tell you this story. When we, we wrote a song for the first Phineas movie with Slash from Guns N' Roses, and we were shooting a video with him, and we were rapping at the end of the day, and we all wanted to have dinner together. And so one of the execs and I drove over really quick to this Hollywood restaurant that was supposed to be really good. There were already 20 people who had put their names in and were waiting. And we went up to the hostess and said, uh, there's going to be 12 of us. She's like, well, we'll see what we can do, but it's going to be like an hour and a half, two hours. And I just leaned over and I said, would it make any difference if one of us was Slash? We're coming from a video shoot. And she said, we will seat you as soon as your entire party is here. And they made a table for us for 12 people. I don't know who else I've worked with that would have gotten a 12 top table made out of thin air for them, but actually I do. Taylor Swift would have gotten us a 12 top table and she did take two with Phineas and Ferb. So it's Slash and Taylor Swift. Okay, so about 20 years ago, I designed this character. Harry! Harry the Platypus! And I colored him a teal green because I just thought it looked cool, but since then I've had to answer this question a lot. So why is he green? I just thought it looked cool. You know, platypuses aren't green. And kids' heads aren't triangles. What, what's your point? But guess what just happened? This is a real thing that just happened. They just discovered that platypuses have a special kind of bioluminescence, and in ultraviolet light, 
they glow green. I called it. I called it. Ah, Patty the Platypus, why are you green again? Is it because Dan was decades ahead of the scientific community? I'm very pleased with myself. All right, most of you know me from Phineas and Ferb, Milo Murphy's Law, and the, the new movie. But what you probably don't realize is I also wrote this, the Campfire Song song, when I was on Spongebob. Fire and sing our campfire I was writing and boarding for that show. I went home and wrote that song, recorded it with my band, brought it back in, and my writing partner at the time, Jay Lender, he said that when Spongebob points to Patrick, Patrick, he shouldn't be just trying to keep up with the letters and not able to, which is how I'd originally pitched it. He said he should say, letters, 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 letters which I thought was much, much funnier. So I took it home and re-recorded that part. And that's the way it was for a long time, but at some point in the editing process, Steve and or Derek decided to make it back to the way I had originally uh, pitched it. I think it would have been much funnier with letters, 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 letters. Oh, yeah! So I was in the Phineas and Ferb writer's room with Martin and Jim, two of my writers, and we were just throwing out lines for this scene, and I said, that idea just may be crazy enough to get us all killed! And they laughed and said, we should do that. And I said, no, we can't use that. That's from something. And they was like, I don't recognize it. I've never heard it. We should, we should use that. And no, I said, I didn't just make that up. That's from something. I'm remembering something. Here, I'll, I'll look it up. And I, and I typed those words into my uh, Google Drive. And hit, sure enough, here it is. That idea may just be crazy enough to get us all killed. It's from a SpongeBob that I wrote with Jay Lender and had completely forgotten about, apparently. But in my defense, I'm pretty sure that Jay wrote that line. Yes, yes I did. So we wrote so many songs for Phineas that we occasionally did parody versions of our own songs. We wrote our, our own Weird Al versions of songs we had already written, like What's Rusted. You? You're busted. Busted. Don't you know that you've been oxidized? Or I Couldn't Kick My Way Right Into Her Heart. Ladies and gentlemen, love handle! But then on Milo Murphy's Law, there was a song I had to write that was sort of a love boat theme. And we'd already done sort of a love boat song for Phineas and Ferb, so I took that music and I wrote my own Weird Al version of it for Milo Murphy's Law, which happens to have Weird Al in it, so I got Weird Al to sing my Weird Al version of my own song. <laughs> sort of like a snake eating its own tail. Okay, this video is for Dan Pavenmeyer because we have a question. We've been watching Phineas and Ferb, and we're trying to figure out how on earth they're able to afford to do all of this. There's no way it's just from an allowance. That's a fair question. On the first day of their summer, they built that roller coaster, and Phineas says this. We should have charged more. So they charged admission for the roller coaster, took those profits and invested them very wisely. And that's been funding their summer ever since.